Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to this first episode of the new realities of disclosure and cosmic awakening. I'm Alan Steinfeld and my co-host Deborah Giusti. Making contact. <laughs> yes, and we're going to show a little clip here of what that means and what this program's all about. So here we go with the clip. So this is what we have in store for us this week and the next couple of weeks. From deep, deep in outer space, to planet Earth, to the Red Rocks of Sedona, to our online community here, comes a time, a message, a special series on making contact. There is no better time for making contact. I'm George Norrie, host of the national radio show Coast to Coast AM. Alan Steinfeld has put together a well-conceived collection that covers it all. Thanks, George, for that introduction. This is Alan Steinfeld, the editor and author of Making Contact, which is a collection of writings of the best and brightest people in the field of ufology. I'm putting together a special series of some of these fantastic contributors to my book. People like Whitley Strieber, Linda Moulton Howe, Carolyn Corey, Nick Pope, JJ and Desiree Hurtock, Adam Apollo, the alien lady Mary Rodwell, and such contactees as Marina Serin and Kamara Jones and the art of Kamara Jones, plus some very special surprises in the field. Please join me for this fantastic series of dialogues as I dive deeper into anything I've done before. For more information and for a complete description of the five-week course, go to makingcontactseries.com. George, any final comments? The contributions of all these people help to give insight into the multifaceted intentions of the phenomena because Making Contact presents the opportunity for us to prepare to meet advanced civilizations. Someday, <clears throat> somehow in the future, the conflicts that have plagued our species for eons will come to an end. And by making contact, we will take our rightful place among the stars. The Making Contact series is presented by Alan Steinfeld and New Realities, Deborah Giusti and the Global Peace Tribe, in association with Neil Gar, Portal to Ascension, and Star Family Wisdom. Join us for this online series Making Contact, The New Realities of Disclosure and Cosmic Awakening, Thursdays beginning May 19th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific Time. To find out more and to sign up, go to makingcontactseries.com. See you there. Great. Well, welcome, welcome. Obviously, everyone here has already signed up. Deborah, why don't you do the introductions? Well, welcome, everyone, to what's going to be an incredibly informative fascinating and cutting edge program, Making Contact, The New Realities of Disclosure and Cosmic Awakening. And you're definitely in the right place at the right time if you're with us live right now, or you're watching this replay to explore the latest information of what's currently being revealed in terms of UFO disclosure, but more important to go beyond acknowledging that they're present and to deeply understand and experience our true relationship with galactic civilizations. I'm Deborah Giusti of the Global Peace Tribe, along with Alan Steinfeld of New Realities. We are excited to bring you this series, which features the top experts in this field, including investigators, whistleblowers, scientists, all the way to star seeds, experiencers, and even hybrids. While this topic of UFOs has always been a passion of mine, I pursued it ever since I was a child. And like many of you, I've been aware that the truth about contact has not been available on mainstream media. So I've always pursued the underground sources. But the time is now, during these unprecedented times, all that's hidden, that all that has been hidden is coming up to the surface to be revealed and hopefully healed as we work together to create the new earth. So we've seen this totally in the last two years with so many issues in our world that were previously hidden, whether it's secret government, child trafficking, environmental destruction. Now the information is out in the open and the Internet allows us to communicate this all over the world. And this is certainly true with UFO disclosure. Synchronistically, two days ago before this launch, 
the U.S. Congress held the first public hearing on UFOs in 50 years. And I'm sure you're also seeing all the documentations of sightings now in mainstream media and with the new platforms on the internet evolving now beyond the censorship, bits and pieces of the puzzle are being released to the masses. And we are going to address all this in our session tonight and throughout the series. But for many of us, there's not an issue to prove that they're here. It's pretty obvious that with billions of stars in the planets, there is life and civilizations beyond what humanity has achieved in this current lifetime. So in this series, we want to understand why are the extraterrestrials coming here? What do they have to teach us? And more important, what is our personal and spiritual connection to the galactics and their involvement in our cosmic awakening? So that's what Alan and I are very excited to bring to you. And we're not waiting for government disclosure. We are claiming disclosure is happening now through all of us, through the people. We claim our birthright to know, to inform each other, and to assist each other in the global awakening that's happening now. And we also claim that the galactics have an important interest in our evolution and play a part in our awakening. And we are gonna explore this with you totally. So we offer you this five-part series and give you a comprehensive understanding of what's possible. And we also invite you to share about this series. Anyone can sign up on our website, makingcontactseries.com. And we would love for this information to go out far and wide to support disclosure all around the world at this important time. So now I would like to introduce you to Alan Steinfeld. He is the author of Making Contact, which was the inspiration of this series. For over 30 years, Alan has hosted and produced the weekly television series called New Reality. And his New Reality YouTube channel has to date over 22 million viewers with 76,000 subscribers. And he's been on the forefront of this movement, interviewing and supporting all the incredible speakers that you're gonna see in this series. And he's been an incredible partner in this series. And I would definitely share that, Alan, we have a sole contract to bring this to the world tonight. So welcome, Alan Steinfeld. Thank you, Deborah. I have to say it has been an incredible process working with you. You are on top of the spiritual pulse of, of our time. And we, not just spiritually, but the, the UFO phenomena it's about all of us waking up to another level of who we are as human beings. This book, Making Contact, is a collection of 11 different essays. And I'm so happy three of those authors are here today, including Nick Pope, who kicks off the series in this book by grounding it in real world um, disclosure. So we're going to be getting to that, but I just want to welcome everyone here because there's at least a thousand people who signed up for this, and this proves to me and all of us here, this is a worldwide movement. This is a movement up to us, up to us to bring out the truth. We cannot rely on government, obviously, by what we saw on Tuesday for people who saw it. It was a lot of jargon. They showed like one little clip of a craft that was barely visible. I don't know what they're expecting us to believe. It just gives our movement more fuel to come forward with a deeper truth. So we are at a threshold of a new time. And for me, and I know JJ and Desiree and Nick, this is a moment we've been waiting for. So we're all in this together. You know, I like to quote Martin Luther King, who said, we may have all come here on a different ship, but now we're all in the same boat and we're waiting for that ship to arrive, that new ship. But anyway, here we are at a moment in history, and this is why me and Deborah have decided to do this event right now. And it just so happened that there were these congressional hearings just two days ago, and we're gonna talk to the guy who's really on top of what's going on with the uh, disclosure movement. He, I'll just introduce Nick Pope, and then I'll go after Nick presents, I'll talk We'll talk to my friends, doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtak about the sort of the cosmic origins. But for Nick, I'm really happy he's here because like I said, he, he started, he kicked off the book with the first chapter about 
why governments don't tell us and what they will tell us. So maybe we'll go a little deeper into that today. But Nick Pope worked as a civilian employee for the UK Ministry of Defense for 21 years. And for much of the early 90s, he's posted to a division where his duties were to reach out, to research and investigate the UFO phenomena to access the defense, national security, and flight safety implications. After having take er, taken early retirement, he returned to the program to declassify and release most of the MOD, Ministry of Defense, UFO files, many of which he wrote himself. He uh, now lives in the United States since 2012. He works as a broadcaster journalist. He's currently hosting and moderating eight on an an ancient alien tour, but recently he's been on NBC, CNN, Fox News. He's been all over the news because we are at a moment in time where if they're not going to tell us what's going on, we need people like Nick to tell us what's going on. So Nick, what is going on? What did we see the other day? And what can we hope to see in the future? Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alan, and, and thank you also, Deborah. Thank you, Doctors JJ and Desiree Hertak, and most important of all, thank you to the audience, to to everyone who's either watching this live or, or later on on catch up. So what I'm what I'm going to do, I have about twenty minutes, and I'm going to spend most of that really giving, I suppose, a, an overview of Tuesday's congressional hearings, just a little bit of background and my personal take on things. And hopefully, you know, I don't, I don't claim any, any sort of universal insight into this, but having, having run a, a small UAP or UFO program myself, I, you know, that terminology is now used interchangeably. Hopefully I can bring, bring something of an insider's perspective to what happened on Tuesday. So I think the first and most important thing by way of introduction is to a lot of people will say, well, why did this hearing happen? Um, and, and the reason, there are a number of reasons for it. Um, in, the ones, in one sense, it's a culmination of a process which has been going on for about four and a half years, which started on December 16th, 2017, when the New York Times published the story about the existence of ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, a program still shrouded in mystery and dogged by some controversies for sure. The true nature of the program and its outputs are still being debated. But it's important to say that the Department of Defense have acknowledged after some initial flip-flopping, but they have now acknowledged that part of what ATIP did was look at UFOs. So I don't think that's disputed. And, and with that revelation of the existence of ATIP came acknowledgement that there had been some cases where US military jets had encountered these, these objects, you've all seen, I'm sure. If not, they're freely available on the internet. Uh, those three, well, there are, there are more than three, but the three best known videos of US Navy jets chasing UFOs. Uh, I suppose the iconic case is still the 2004 Tic Tac UFO involving the, the USS Nimitz. And few, few quotes for me, by the way, encapsulate the sense of awe and wonder uh, better than Commander David Fravor, the, the, uh, one of the F-18 Super Hornet pilots who encountered the Tic Tac. And he said, I don't know what it was, but I want to fly one. So when you have, I mean, these top guns don't impress easily, but when one of these top guns sees something like that, experiences it in speeds, maneuvers, accelerations that frankly run rings around our own aircraft, including the one he was flying, then sure, you pick up and, and, and you pay attention. So, so all those events 
were like a line of dominoes falling. The existence of ATIP, the US Navy videos, um, a number of pilots and radar operators coming forward to talk about this, some of the intelligence community personnel who had been involved in some of these programs. The UAP task force, classified briefings in Congress, um, the list goes on and on. What this led to, and I talk about Tuesday as a culmination, is the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022 stipulated that, that there should be, I mean, there were multiple UFO provisions in the act. And one of the things it called for was regular classified briefings of Congress, but also at least one annual report to the public. Now we had one, we had a preliminary assessment, if people remember, last June, when the Office of the Director of National Intelligence published a nine page unclassified summary. Again, none of this is in dispute. You know, if, if those of you who've been involved in this subject for a while will know that almost every previous occasion where there have been videos of pilots chasing UFOs, uh, documents purporting to be government documents, people have challenged it, and rightly so. Um, it's always good to ask questions, but this is 100% verified. Um, everything that I'm talking about can be seen on the Department of Defense website, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence website. It's all up there. It's all confirmed as genuine. They don't necessarily profess to know what it is, but it's, it's out there and it's official. So multiple UAP, UFO, UAP provisions in, in the uh, Defense Appropriation Act. And so... Uh, one of the people who felt most strongly about this uh, was Congressman Andre Carson. And so on Tuesday, the, the so-called C3 subcommittee of the House Intelligence Committee had this hearing. And uh, C3 basically is counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and counterproliferation. So it's, it's a very important cutting edge, uh, quite technology based in its way, subcommittee of, of um, the intelligence committee. And I should say that by the way, the, the intelligence committees and the armed services committees in both the Senate and the House have been involved. But uh, Congressman Andre Carson said, right, let's get down to business. Let's, part of what makes this so important is that the American people deserve some answers. And, and indeed, the people of the world deserve some answers because the United States, for whatever reason, is in, in the spotlight with this issue right now. It's certainly not the only nation in the game, but, but being in the spotlight, some, some degree of leadership is, is called for. So Representative Carson said, I want, I want public hearings because accountability and transparency is a key part of, of what we should be trying to achieve with this because people feel very strongly about this. They're passionate. You've only got to see the reaction in the last two days. And it feels like I've just been running from, from interview to interview on, on this. And I hope people have caught some of them. And, and those of you that didn't, catch the hearing itself of course please please um you know make some time you know make a coffee whatever you like and um and just sit back and watch it and make of it what you may some standouts for me i i mean i don't i don't want to spend my time just giving a, a description of what happened because i hope i hope a lot of you have already seen it and i hope that those that haven't will will go and see it. But I just want to pick out a couple of quotes and a couple of things that I think were very important and give some, some personal views. Uh, the two people, by the way, who were leading the briefing were uh, Ronald Moultrie, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, and Scott Bray, Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence. And... Um, I thought one of the most amusing moments was when Ronald Moultrie 
confessed that he was actually something of a science fiction fan and had been to conventions at at time and he said but i don't necessarily dress up for them and one of the congress uh, people kind of shot back and said well i'm not sure that not necessarily dressing up puts the matter beyond dispute but uh, that's i guess that's congressional humor for you but what he said which was critically important was when he said that we are open to all hypotheses because i think what happened in the hearing is that the three main not the only by any means but the three main the three most popularly discussed in the media theories were unpacked theory number 1 this is our own technology this is some sort of us black program tag maybe being blind tested by one part of the military by another all so highly classified and deeply compartmentalized um, that that the us government has effectively been chasing its tail for the last four and a half years on this um, theory number two that it's adversary technology adversary drones china russia uh, wh whoever it might be theory number three of course the one that's captured the media and the public imagination is that it's extraterrestrial. So it was very, very important. Look, they don't necessarily want all, all the hue and cry that comes with this. So if, if they were able to eliminate that option now and take it off the table, and um, if, if they were able to defuse all this interest, they would like nothing better because for all the talk of openness and encounter, accountability, you know, the sorts of people that run these intelligence programs, it's a nightmare for them to suddenly have, have something like this where, where you know, not only are there public hearings, but I mean, how many people in the general public had really even heard of the C3 subcommittee of the House Intelligence Committee before all this, but now everyone's going, oh, what do those people do? That's not what they want. So if they could have eliminated this by saying, look, I, let me just start with a statement to, to make it abundantly clear, um, even if we're not entirely sure what's going on, we know this isn't extraterrestrial. They did not make that statement. They could not make that statement. All hypotheses are still in play. And, and they've been looking at this, bear in mind, they've been looking at it quite long and hard now with resources and capabilities that, that would stagger most people, whether it's, whether it's satellites, whether it's, it's uh, air defense network with its sophisticated uh, radar systems, whether it's forward-looking infrared cameras mounted on some of these jets, um, wh whatever it is, and one of the most important points that was that came up in the hearing was that none of this is hangs on a single thread it's not as if we are just talking about pilot sightings or some strange blips on a radar it's everything happening at once pilots seeing things simultaneously being tracked on radio radar simultaneously being filmed also showing up on um, electro-optical, on weapon seeker, and sometimes, this was in the ODNI report published last June, it also came out on Tuesday, some of this is putting out radio frequency energy. Right. I, I went into some of that in, in chapter one of, of Alan's book, uh, for those that want a, a deeper dive into to some of that, but this is this is very important uh, point of of all this because some people say, oh, couldn't this just be some um, I, I I don't know exotic atmospheric plasma phenomena? Could could it be a system error? Could it be a glitch on the radar? When they start telling you in the C three 
briefing that this is the sort of RF energy being put out is, is what you would expect to see if someone was trying to jam you, mm -hmm. trying to jam your systems. Mm -hmm. So what that says, and, and this was confirmed, is that the assessment is that most of the things that they're looking at are uh, judged to be solid objects. And there is a technology deployed there. And clearly where there's a technology, there is an intelligence directing that technology. One of the questions from one of the congressional representatives was, well, have you tried to communicate? Even if you send out a blast saying, hey, this is the United States, you're in our airspace, who are you, what do you want? Um, does the reply come back in Chinese? Does it come back in Russian? Does it come back in Romulan <laughs> <laughs> or something? Or more likely, does it come back in, in pure math? I, I don't know. I don't know. But, but look, the fact that those questions are now being freely asked means, I think, that the gloves are off. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I suppose the downside of some of this was that quite a lot, and they don't like to do this because it makes people even more suspicious, but... But when, for example, there was a question about, well, wait a minute, we're hearing, we read in the media, not just about these things in the atmosphere, but we read about this so-called transmedium travel and things being detected underwater. And the response to that was, I think we'll take that in the closed session right. that follows this open public hearing. Right. And several times, for those of you who've seen it, you'll recall, they said, we'll, we'll take that into the classified section, please. Mm -hmm. So a lot obviously happened after the cameras were switched off. One very interesting piece, I thought, was the queuing up of the video. They didn't select the most interesting video they had, not by a long chalk. <laughs> Right. They they actually, I think, picked arguably the the least exciting. And if you're wondering if there's a, a reason for that, absolutely there is. What what you want to do when you're running something like this is you want to show your your weakest material, your most prosaic stuff. So because you don't want, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want this under the spotlight. Mm -hmm. So you want people looking at that and saying, well, wait a minute, that's just a camera artifact, or, or that's just a, a mylar balloon. So it was very interesting that they didn't really do a deep dive into Tic Tac, Go Fast, and Gimbal, though, though they were briefly referenced. But, but essentially, five minutes of the hearing was taken up with, with frankly, something taken from the cockpit by a, a pilot who grabbed his cell phone out of his, his pocket and, and shot some fairly unremarkable footage. Why didn't they show the best stuff? Same reason why when the Ministry of Defense declassified and released its, its files, they made a great point of, there was a lot of anticipation about a particular UFO photograph. Now the photograph, they say, went missing. But what they did show was a, a, a fuzzy, blurry, indistinct, black and white photocopy of a viewfoil of the original picture. So by the time it was released, it was about third or fourth generation. And of course, they say, oh, this is the picture everyone's been talk talking about. And everyone says, well, that's not very remarkable. That's exactly what they want you to say. That's so look, these people are career intelligence officers. They do this for a living. And uh, some of what was said was about saying the right things about openness and accountability. But some of what happened was absolutely about these people trying to drive the narrative and steer the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of final observations, one more point, and then I'll, uh, I'll yeah. hand over. But, uh, one thing that I thought was very positive was when um, the briefer said, we do want to find out 
what we're dealing with. And we are not the only player in this. So we undertake to get together with the other people who do have, uh, you know, skin in this game, like NASA, mm. like the Space Force. And we will get together with them to try to come up with a fuller, better assessment of what it is we're dealing with. And, and they said, look, it's not our job to find this. This was, I, I think, if you read between the lines of the way this was put, they said, it's not our job to find alien life. And I'm paraphrasing, but if it is found, maybe by some of these other people like NASA, if it is found, it is our job to say, is there or isn't there a threat here to the United States? So I know that doesn't necessarily play well with some of the more spiritual people, but it is what it is. And I'm, I'm just, I guess, saying that that's, that's how people in government view mm -hmm. that. Um, right. Coming off that subject for a moment, I just want to, I, I think... Uh, Alan and and Deborah and I and and um, we, we were just briefly discussing this before the event started. One other interesting thing, Alan asked me about the recent release of fifteen hundred pages of right. UFO related documentation, and I I had said it's a big story, but a lot of that material has been out previously what the defense intelligence agency did with that release was that they they were effectively saying look this is a consolidate this is a consolidation of a lot of previous freedom of information act requests but now we want to put it in one place and where they put it was in the dia's electronic reading room and they put it up under the heading uap unidentified aerial phenomena within about three or four hours, it had been removed from the, the website. And it transpired. The reason for that was that the DOD, as the parent agency of DIA, objected to it having been posted under the title UAP because they said, while we acknowledge that ATIP did look at UAP data, we still take, we still stick to our position. It was not primarily a UAP program. So it was put up, it was taken down, it's now back up again, but essentially under the title ATIP. Well, I'm going to show, that's... I'm just going to show that while you're talking, okay. that headline of these uh, Freedom of Information Act and what they were showing us, which is kind of negative and putting people in a kind of fearful position. Uh, but go ahead, Nick, keep going. Yeah. Why, why that's important is that it, it shows that, that not everyone who has responsibility for this subject within the US government, the military, and the intelligence agencies, not everyone is on the same song sheet here. There are differences of opinion about the true nature of the phenomenon, and there are differences in opinion in how to handle the phenomenon and how much or how little to tell the public. And I think that's where I want to end my, my opening presentation by saying, look, it's not cut and dry. There are different opinions here. And moving forward, expect, you know, they don't want to be too public about their disagreements for obvious reasons. But if you read between the lines, you will see the tensions are there. Like, that's why that anecdote is so important, because it illustrates they're not speaking with a single voice here. What can we expect moving forward? More congressional action on this, obviously. Uh, more holding the DOD and the intelligence community to account. And more of a push for that joined up response that I was talking about. You know, not not just the military, but the intelligence community, NASA, Space Force, um, FBI, Homeland Security, and others too. And mm. long overdue, the the scientific community, people 
people like the Galileo Project, perhaps run by Professor Avi Loeb at, at Harvard. So interesting times for sure. Tuesday was an important step. There are many more important steps ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nick. A few things just to touch up on, like it's not just Congress coming forward. There seems to be worldwide increase in sightings around the globe. So that's one thing that is also pushing this envelope forward. There's something else I want to ask you about. This is a tweet. Um, can you see that? No, you can't see that tweet. Let me just... There's a tweet by Adam Schiff of the... Um, let me see, does that come up? No, that doesn't come up there. Anyway, there's a tweet by Schiff that talks about how he wanted transparency and Adam Schiff, if everyone knows, is part of one of the intelligence committees. And obviously, he didn't. we didn't get transparency at all. So Nick, and maybe JJ and Desiree could jump in, who's making the decisions about how, certainly not the guys we saw on Tuesday. They're just probably fall guys. So who's pulling the strings behind the scenes? Well, on, on this, on Tuesday's hearing, I, I think the answer to that question is is very clear. Um, sec def. So so um, you you know the Secretary of Defense on this on some of the other aspects as as we get into more on the intelligence side. Obviously, it will be DNI Haynes. But and and what is their investment? Are they they want to cover the secret? Um, Haynes actually mentioned the word extraterrestrial. How invested, they, in your opinion, do they want to keep it secret or are they slowly leaking it out because they're obviously not coming out with it all at once? So what's your opinion? Well, I think it, it goes back to what I was saying about they're not speaking with one voice. Frankly, frankly, Alan, they're in a little bit of a mess at, at the moment. And I, I think there are, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I think it is fair to say that there are factions. And when you talk, when you talk to Danny Sheehan, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know that he's going to be able to say much about Lou Elizondo's complaint to the Inspector General, because because that investigation and, and things is still going on. But if he can, if he can maybe say something about it, I think the fact that there is a complaint like that is illustrative of of this factional fighting that mm. that I'm alluding to, and and I think frankly they're they're a little bit stuck at the moment. But something else that's at the back of their mind, I, I guarantee, is this: James Webb Space Telescope is is now out there, and I think it's really really focused people's minds on. Look, the moment they point that thing in the right place. If there is something like a Dyson sphere orbiting a, a, a nearby star system, it's going to be game over. And, and I think it's a realization that something like that is possible that's mm -hmm. causing some of these people to say, hey, look, we, we want to be ahead of the narrative here. We don't want to be reacting. So, so maybe let's, let's try and put ourselves in the driving seat. But as I say, there are still factions. There are still disagreements. And expect some of that. And it's not, by the way, very important point. It's not party political. One of the great things about this is that it's bipartisan. My goodness, how, how few issues are there where you can get somebody like Marco Rubio on one side and Kirsten Gillibrand on the other, standing shoulder to shoulder, agreeing with each other that more should be done about this and people should be told more. Well, I'm just going to show that. I think I have it here. No, there. Do you see that? No, you don't see the clip. I'm trying to show you the atom shift, um, but I'll get to that. I want to bring in uh, doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtak, who've been, but thank you, Nick, and stick around because there's a lot more to go into and unpack. And, you know, for people just finding out about this whole cover up and disclosure, this is a story that's been in process for. 75 years at least and we and, and it's pretty exciting it's like a shakespearean drama where you think you're getting close to the end and people are coming forward and they're hiding the secret and 
now more revelations are coming. So that's why I invited my friends, Drs. J.J. and Desiree Hurtak, who have been in the investigation of this phenomena, well, for 49, 50 years, and they really have a handle on what are they covering up, what's really going on, and the big picture of cosmology. So, uh, J.J., Desiree, what's your response to what Nick said, and what do you have to add? Well, I, I have to say, first of all, thank you, Deborah, Alan, and Nick for having us all together. And I just wanted to say what we really did like was the fact that Scott Bray, who is Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, was one of the people called forth because years ago, Dr. Hertak and I were very good friends with an admiral who said, yeah, I mean, the Navy is back in those days, and that was 70s and 80s, was far beyond even the Air Force in uh, understanding the existence of what he called extraterrestrial intelligence. Of course, he didn't make a public statement about that and he's not no longer on the planet. But bottom line, the Navy really, and we always said this in many, many talks that we gave over the, the past years, the Navy is really on top of it. Now, of course, it's gone out to the Space Force and the Air Force and other things like that. But I thought it was interesting that some of the very first talks publicly, like we just heard, had this naval director. And I applaud him, even though the pictures were not good for being able to at least come forward and try to say they're doing something. And I think that's about as far as they went. Right. I also would like to add uh, years ago when I worked with Dr. Ellen Heineck in, in Brazil, Ellen said uh, Project Blue Book, which closed in 1969, was a cosmic Watergate, a $6 million cover up. And you can add zeros in the last 52 years to $6 billion cover-up because the uh, Tic Tac event was really from the oceans. That was the authentic Watergate uh, update or water, should we say, portal to a whole new cosmology. So there's so much that was left out of the discussions as of today that bears a reconsideration. We are uh, seeing a new roadmap, so we say, of the dialogue amongst nations we're suddenly discovering that we're not alone and that need really the citizen diplomacy to push this information in the great direction of a global commons where we can look at all of the information gathered over the last um, 75 plus years by scientists working behind the scenes. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. One of the first things we wanted to point out was this uh, document. And this is uh, from is, Freedom of oh, Information yeah, sorry, go back to that I shared really with, with the late uh, Stanton Friedman, who was a nuclear physicist. And let me read this for those of you who don't have glasses. United States scientists believe that low magnetic fields do not have a serious effect on astronauts, but high magnetic fields, oscillating magnetic fields, and electromagnetic field can also have considerable effect there is a theory that such field or fields are closely associated with superconductivity at very low temperature, such as in space. This in turn is related to the possible propulsion system of UFOs. There is a rumor that fragments of a possible UFO found in Brazil bore a relationship to superconductors and magnetohydrodynamics. This is a subject that was forbidden to be discussed in scientific papers, both in Russia and the United States for many years. But I had the opportunity to work behind the scenes at low profile, of course, for many years in field investigations. And part of my work took me to Brazil. I connected with those in government there and I had the opportunity to bring back some of the metallurgical specimens that were then given to NASA and Air Force intelligence. And like British intelligence, uh, the Brazilian intelligence have come forward and say, hey, we've seen some very unusual things. You know, we think that they are maybe not of this world. And, uh, you know, they're willing to move forward. It's, it really does seem everyone's waiting for the U.S. government to say something. And, and it is such a sl slow release. You know, I hope it's even, even in my own lifetime. But I do feel because there's so much more going on from the other side from these extraterrestrials. So we have to look at the cosmic landscape of what the other nations have done also behind the scenes in the last 75 plus years. So we can go to the next document or exhibit. This Wait, is example that's of right. that's right. I just want to ask you one question. You say that the other, the ETs themselves may be in on 
not coming forward right away. Is that what you want? Some people have said that. Uh, I believe they're probably going to slowly have more and more contact with humans. I think they have been. You know, but actually, Alan, as you've said many times, I think it comes from Stanton Freeman mm-hmm. that, you know, why would these extraterrestrials want to work, work with people that are interested in tribal warfare? And I've often quoted the New York Times, who said the last 3000 years of history, we've had about 270 years of global peace. That's not a very good thing. Why do they want us up there? In fact, and we're not going to show it tonight, but, you know, there was a Russian phobus probe to the satellite of Mars. And, uh, you know, some people say that it had some nuclear stuff in there. Or, or dual use technology is the technical word. In 1989, it was intercepted. We have the actual pictures and film released from Russian authorities, which were not uh, released in this country, but on uh, on Mexico City television uh, back in 1989, Mm -hmm. showing that there's more to the story. Right, and so they really don't want our, certainly nuclear, we can see that with Bentwaters and many other things. They don't want any of that of us out there in space. And I think if we're willing to go beyond that, which many people have claimed to have said, including the movie, you know, of the day the earth stood still, if we're willing to go beyond that, then maybe they will have better contact. Here's a sample, uh, Dr. Jack had a medal. Sample. Um, I brought this back to my colleague, Marcel Vogel, Dr. Marcel Vogel at IBM, noted scientist who developed the chemistry for the, the storage of information on the larger magnetic disk back in the 1970s and 80s. And Marcel uh, looked at this and was intrigued by the interesting aspect of the metal you see on the right hand side of the screen that has no molecular center. If you look on the left hand side, the micrograph will show a high concentration of palladium and gold, uh, very precious metals that you would not put in a large spaceship. But I have to say, going back to that 1,500 page report, and even what Nick just said about radio frequencies, a lot of the things coming from these technologies that we're seeing, now now there's others that are beyond what most people have been able to really classify and see, but it's using technologies that are not completely distinct from our own reality. Radio frequencies being one, and I think that's why SETI, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is is out there looking. For the black hole and beyond. (laughs) As a matter of fact, all these artifacts have gone down into a government black hole. But even this metal, and I think other people who have reported metals, have not found unusual, too many unusual metals that we haven't been able to detect. And of course, this is back in the 70s and 80s looking at this, but have found unusual structures of the metal. Like this had no molecular center is what uh, Marcel said about that. And that made it more unusual. So there was a lot of, you know, I, I don't think we even, when we're looking even at extraterrestrials, I say the most unusual thing about what people claim to see is that they kind of look like us. Well, that means you know, our DNA code, which NASA has found, is completely out there in space. Anin, guanine, Ursel, I mean, they're all now been found out in space. Right. And, and Gary Nolan says that DNA is actually older than the planet itself. So. Right. Which so, we would agree, and of course, a little alteration of that, even on this planet, can get pigs. So we, how do you get work our- with the Russian physicist uh, Peter Garayev, and also with Russian scientists in Novosibirsk, who know that there is a larger active cosmology that we must gradually accept if we're going to be honest. But it doesn't take that much rearranging of our DNA code to have some unusual life forms, and you know whether it's reptilians. Well, Let's go into Gordon Cooper, because he's one of the few astronauts that actually saw things actually before he was an astronaut. And well, you- Gordon and I and Desiree were close friends. We worked together on a book by Sidney Sheldon called Doomsday Conspiracy, which was the takeoff of a military officer in Europe that had contact, physical contact with an extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Gordy was the flagship for this, and he was very close to us in his book released in 2000 called Leap of Faith. I quote the following. <laughs> The first American president to answer a question at an official press conference about UFOs following a rush of public sightings, President Harry Truman said on April 4th, 1950, quote, I can assure you that flying saucers, given that they exist, are not constructed by any power on Earth. End of quote. This is on page 
89 of this remarkable book. So actually, here's a president that's saying more in the past than we are saying today. And I know, Alan, you and I were- But even more provocative yeah. than what he says on okay. the following page, quote, but as I see it, our government is now trapped in a big box of old lies. It's going to take a lot of courage on the part of some future administration to say, quote, folks, our government has been lying to you all these years. Now we're going to come clear and tell you the real truth, end of quote. As I said, that's going to take courage, something there doesn't seem to be in surplus of it in Washington these days, end of quote. And so Gordy, one of the Mercury Seven, one of the great pioneers in outer space, a man of faith who prayed in outer space, said to us privately, we're going to have to have really a reformation within the government, bringing together all the disciplines, not simply aerospace information, but environmental information, things dealing with the economic changes, the social changes, all of these, shall we say, isms that will have to be reset according to a higher cosmic blueprint. So one of the interesting things about Gordon Cooper, I always say, is that actually in 1951, when he was just simply flying advanced planes, similar to what would be the equivalent today of favor from the uh, F-18 Hornet, he actually was paralleling East and West Germany. And he said he would go there with these, and he'd see MiGs next to him and they'd be paralleling each other over the borders, kind of, you know, making fun of each other. And he said, all of them looked up and they saw a flotilla, not just one, but a flotilla of extraterrestrial spacecraft. And he knew, he was one of the top you know, pilots at the time, he knew what our technology was. This is in the 50s. We're not talking now, you know, this century. So he knew what we had and he knew what, what, that we didn't have that technology. He came back, he reported it. What did they do? Put him in a straitjacket? No, they made him an astronaut. And I say that that really means the fact that there's those people behind some of these programs that knew extraterrestrials were there, were watching. And we even hear that from Buzz Aldrin. If you go back to his older stuff, he doesn't like to talk about it today. But he said the first time they went, really, which was the touchdown of on the moon, they were followed by lights all the way there, not just locally. So, you know, there's so many people that have made public statements about this that are very, very credible. And still we get what we had on Tuesday, but it's a step forward. I agree with Nick. So it might be a step forward, but we haven't made much progress in really getting to the ET presence. We are just kind of fighting each other in a sense. So I know you have some interesting footage coming up that I want. Well, not footage, but just to yeah. talk about. Those are eight yeah. felt because of the time slot. We wouldn't show our films, <laughs> but we have films on each of these subject areas. The next gentleman that we work with was uh, Carlos Diaz in Mexico, Tepatzlan, Mexico, where our International Academy also has a base of investigation. And what we see in the upper left-hand side of the screen is this strange uh, spacecraft looking more like a biosphere rather than a technical UFO yeah, or most extraterrestrial people, ship. Most people call it a uh, plasma ship because as he describes, and you can hear some of this in some of the videos that he's talked about, he actually was able to put his hand in and then he felt it around and then finally he was sucked into it. But when he was sucked into it, he didn't see like some sort of control panel. I mean, some people do, this is a different type of ship. Um, but what he saw was everything was this kind of yellowish orange color. And they took him to certain places and showed him certain technologies that made him realize that a lot of it that they were working with was consciousness because he, he touched this like kind of similar looking little globe egg that he was given. And he felt he was literally flying like an eagle. So he was saying that they had been able to take some of the consciousness of an eagle and, and hold it, maybe just borrow it in a certain sense or share it so that they could experience some of the flight scenarios of this eagle. Anyway, that was just his report. And, and he also one more said thing, though, uh, JJ, is that the, areas. go ahead, Alan. I was just saying the, the effect on consciousness is very prevalent among encounters. So they have the ability to shift 
our perceptions, our perspective, our understanding of reality itself. And that's one of the things the government just doesn't know what to do with. How do you talk about consciousness if you're just worried about defending yourself? So this well, is, this is a very important topic. And of course, you know that Desiree and I work with several SRI, Stanford Research Institute scientists, and published a textbook entitled Mind Dynamics in Space and Time of Holding Up, right. a picture of it right now. It's over 700 pages of documentation by the best mathematicians and physicists in the United States who began to realize that both mind as well as matter come out of consciousness, capital C. Right. That we're undergoing a change now from a reductionistic science to one that is futuristic or recognizing that consciousness is behind really the way we think is really the future frontier without recognizing that we are multidimensional beings in a consciousness universe, we have no opportunity to see the big screen of how there's interconnection between the micro and the macro. Well, one of the persons who did put that together was who we see here, George Van Tassel, who was one of the early contactees in the 50s, and he was directed to build this chamber called the Integratron when he was out at Giant Rock in Joshua Tree, Yucca Valley. And so we worked with George. We knew him back in the 60s in 70s. And uh, we were very well acquainted with him. Of course, he was an aerospace engineer that worked with Howard Hughes. But I want to say something about that, because we've also worked with some scientists who have had contact in Silicon Valley. And uh, Alan, as you know, from your book, Making Contact, that even just seeing a UFO, there seems to be this quantum entanglement. And I think that's so interesting. But also what that means, and one of the reasons I also don't think that the government has released such information is because once you are quantumly entangled, you can get downloads. Now, George Van Tassel was sleeping out there at Giant Rock. You can see that in the black and white. In the 1950s. In the 50s. And he, for some reason, woke up went outside, saw this guy look just like us, only probably good looking in a certain sense in his 30s and 40s, even though he's like over 400 years old, and a spacecraft landing right there. And after that, his whole thing was incorporating a better technology. And I think that that kind of also has happened to many people who've had contact. How do you incorporate that? And some of it is really coming in and downloads of information for scientists. And that might be one of the reasons why the government is not so I also, I also want to say I was a co-producer of a film called um, Calling Our oh. Earthlings, which was a documentary about George Van Tassel. And he was directed by these ETs to build this regeneration chamber. And he mysteriously died before he was able to complete it. And that's sort of what- We recommend this film because uh, Desiree and I, a scientist, working with acoustical physics uh, were instrumental in the testing that was done years ago when George was alive. There on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the large groups that would gather yeah. out of 29 Palms in Southern California. On the right-hand side, more recent times that even involved you, Alan, you were there right. for some of the musical tests that we did. And people who were within the sound chamber felt the consciousness being raised and elevated to a remarkable state of feeling right. oneness with the greater picture of life. And it's actually not that far away from the Air Force Base where Gordon Cooper had a second encounter. Is actually his, uh, we'll say those under his command actually took pictures of extraterrestrial spacecraft. He then retrieved that and sent it on to high, well, higher up. Joshua Tree area is a big um, contact uh, center for people. It was a place out. also where the indigenous would gather to make prayers to the higher world. I want to say this also with respect to Carlos Diaz, a man who was very sincere and humanistic in his heart. Very yeah. little furniture in his home, only had a picture of the Christ on the wall was signifying that he was more interested in the spiritual significance of the contact story. So we want to go on to uh, Africa because we want to include people from around the world. One of the other exciting areas that we worked in back in the 1980s and 90s was uh, we spent time with Kredo Mwifwa, the great Zulu shaman, who was uh, native in his theology, but also Christian in his theology. And so he uniquely combined both perspectives. And we had the opportunity to do a film that you see advertised on the right-hand side of the screen at War II. International Film Awards, where Cato speaks of his own personal encounters with extraterrestrial life. Well, he actually had a classical abduction by these little beings. Just what you'd hear at anybody, any conference, this Zulu medicine man had one of those typical encounters. There's more to it than that because Cato went on to outline many different ET types. 
this will be in our new book entitled Image and Similitude. We'll look at these 82 species currently being entertained as, shall we say, other possibilities of life. Right, he did some of the drawings for us of what he saw, and he had several encounters. And I think that's not uncommon. In fact, uh, Alan, I don't know if you're having Travis Walton on, but one of the things is his main uh, experience was profound, but it wasn't the only time he ever saw anything. So it, it tends to repeat itself, you know, and even sometimes goes into families. But he himself uh, had several encounters and he often said, you know, the people who are more modern, they were more in fear. The people who are more, we'll say, you know, people connected more with the earth in that sense and with ancient legends had a greater understanding. So I think, you know, that's why the indigenous people are actually. He also open. said his ancestors, or at least the African peoples of East Africa, had a unique cosmology of life once on Mars. And mm -hmm. so one of the people we went to see, uh, we introduced uh, John Mack to was Credo Mutua, and of course there were other people that brought him to South and, Africa. And the famous John Mack, a uh, psychiatrist from Harvard University. And of course Danny Sheehan saved his job because basically when John Mack started saying, hey, these people are really having experiences, like they wanted to get rid of his well, tenure. People don't know who John Mack is. He was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard University, and he started to look at people who claimed to have experience, and he validated their experience. He said, these people are not crazy, and Harvard didn't like that. They wanted him to put some psychopathology on these people. He said, no, these people are just as normal as anyone else, and he said, what we have to do is change our worldview. So it's John always going to be the naysayers who do not see mental. the larger screen and connect the points of civilization. Yes. Mac's uh, contributions are tremendous, and we want to thank you for including Mac in your book. Yeah, I actually have an unpublished essay. A previous the next uh, edition will include yeah. some of the work that I did with Mac uh, in South Africa with Credo and also the children who were seen uh, and observed by different uh, educational authorities as not going so much through cultural shock, but a type of enlightenment to recognizing we're not alone in the universe. Right, there was an encounter in Zimbabwe, right across the border from the South Africa. The Ariel School. At the Ariel School, and all the kids, they were out playing because the teachers uh, were having like a PTA meeting type of thing, or at least a teacher's meeting. And so they were out there and this vehicle came down, a being came out, and really all the kids saw it. They were somewhat mesmerized uh, looking at the being's eyes, but. It's really quite a, uh, a great- well, uh, the, the beams warned them about environmental hazard, environmental change, and that was the- Exactly. And that was the exact same thing that actually uh, Carlos Diaz was warned about. They, it's the one thing they said to Carlos Diaz is be careful, the environment is having problems. And have we listened? No. So um, let's go to the Elizabeth Clark, because I think, oh, that, yeah, talk about- no, it. We Just, want to show briefly this great, uh, which is a robotic alien, with large wraparound eyes. Or the gray and, type. And also you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen, this small lens that was taken from within the eye sockets. Well, actually, so supposedly from those who have researched the gray aliens, some of the autopsy films, some people believe it and some people don't, supposedly the blackness, one of the really comes off like a contact lens film. And supposedly in addition to that, they helped give us the technology, if you listen to people like Colonel Corso, to help us do night viewing goggles right. and other technologies like fiber optics. Now there's a whole plethora supposedly of what they've helped us with, but I think the probably the um, fiber optic and the night viewing goggles being miniaturized like you see here, this is a, a one of our technologies. Well, so th this is in the that. day after Roswell by Colonel Corso. He said a lot of our um, microchip technology came from the Roswell crash. And, and so here's your. Yeah. But oh. This is perhaps the most important story for us in our world of research field investigations. The story of Elizabeth Clark, who was actually working with British intelligence during the war two, looking at German uh, submarine possibilities. And she had a contact story in the 1950s, and we got to know her very well because she sat upon the gentleman that you see here in the portrait that we're holding on the screen on the left-hand side, came from a certain star system. The planet was called Metone. The Keys of Enoch, which I wrote in 1973 after a higher consciousness experience, 
uh, mentions metone. And so this was a area very precise, very unique in this linguistic uh, connection that made us become close friends. And so she shared with us various reports, including her notebooks that had signatures of Russian, German, British, and American scientists. Officially, she was considered crazy by American ufologists, but privately, top level intelligence officers, some of whom we met in South Africa, knew that she was a real thing. And also, Kredo Mut was spoke on her behalf. And I want to say that her experience was in the 50s. And she wrote about it in the 80s, just because it was not that easy to put this out back then, even though she had talked publicly. And she said that they are these are at the nearest star to us. Which at that time was considered? Bernard star. But in actuality, now we know it's Proxima. And she was saying Alpha and Beta. Uh, Proxima. Well, Proxima. Well, so also, they, we didn't know. We didn't know it was a three-star system, and she said it was a three-star system before we actually discovered it being Alpha Centauri and Beta and Proxima being three stars in one system. Isn't that exactly. So she we said want you to look at the face and recognize we are a part of cosmic civilizations, some of which look like us. And we have friends. And this is the great drama that's taking place in the dialogue of nations to map a new destiny in space, to go beyond the fear syndrome of the negative little aliens from Hollywood, all of this, this lower information that on a gut level closes the chakras or the human dimensions of consciousness development rather than opening up the mind to the symphony of the universe. So we just have two quick slides. This yeah. is a picture which I also thought was just a lens flare, not interesting, kind of what you heard from the government uh, from Bray when he was talking. But actually this was not night vision goggles and. Jaime Malsan, our good friend in Mexico, did research on this and actually it spins. If you've ever seen the actual film footage on this, it actually spins around. And the and, date was this. And uh, there was at least four different people who in actually December saw it. December 2008. It's over the Pentagon, isn't it? Yes, it's actually over the Pentagon at like four in the morning. So we believe that, you know, governments do know what's happening. Other people are starting to see it, realize it. More people are understanding it. And then just a final thing at the very end, and that is the fact that we well, also speak let, in your Let me book. just say that my book, central book, Keys of Enoch, speak of uh, sacred geometries, pyramidal and pentagonal shaped geometries that will appear in the sky as a sign of a different language system. We would call it sacred geometry, a type of linguistic syntax in which we will be able to see how the different cultures of the world are being brought together on a higher level. But, of but meta science. Also, so we also this point that Desiree was making about it being an interdimensional phenomenon. Yeah, Desiree. Right. So we also write in your book, and I have a picture of that making contact here, that in chapter three, that it's not all just about extraterrestrials in our book. And in many people who have done the extra study as well. Uh, it's actually also about other dimensional intelligences. In fact, many of the ones maybe that we see today are really fifth dimensional intelligence coming into the third slash fourth dimension or other frequencies of intelligence. You can look at them as dimension, other dimensions or other frequencies. And we would put also the contact of extra celestials, which we consider like avatar type beings that have maybe been here, but have not bothered coming back as they've kind of gone on to other realities, but are still helping our planet and ultra terrestrials intelligence, which are really much more powerful, divine. And We've gone beyond physical evolution. Completely. Well, that's where I want to bring Nick Pope back into the discussion a little bit. Um, thank you, doctors JJ and Desiree Hurtock. Um, Nick, in the book uh, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, I'm sure you're familiar with it, they were first researching a kind of multiple uh, dimensional effect when the government went in there or a paranormal, which implies multi-dimensionality. How much do you feel this is part of the phenomena from the MOD days that you were involved with? Well, I think it's always, it's, it's always dangerous to, to try and put labels, definitive labels on these things, because I think so much of it, you know, despite the best efforts of some exceptionally smart people, so much of it may be forever or, or at least for the foreseeable future beyond our capacity to understand. So we should always remember that when, when we talk about things like, like you know, aliens, ghosts, angels, demons, these, these are just words that come from our own you know, cultural background, belief systems, etc. 
but yeah, it, it is very interesting. If you read that book, it's clear that uh, the genesis of a lot of ATIP and or SAP, and there's, there's still obviously, as I mentioned, debates going on about the nature of, of those programs. Were they separate programs? Were they different aspects of the same program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a lot, the genesis of this came with uh, James Lukatsky's visit to Skinwalker Ranch and uh, his meeting with Robert Bigelow, for example, who owned the ranch at the time. And it's, it's clearly stated that he believes that when he was at the ranch, he had a, a, an experience. He, he cited a, a weird sort of translucent um, shape, almost like spinning on its axis in front of him in, in the small room. And, and of course, was profoundly moved by by that, and, and it was one of the things that prompted this little group of James Lukatsky, the government scientist, Robert Bigelow, as, as the billionaire owner of Skinwalker Ranch, and Senator Harry Reid, who got them the, the sort of foot in the door in, in getting some government money to study this. And and there's no getting away from the fact that, as you say, they studied some pretty weird things mm -hmm. at Skinwalker Ranch. And for those of you, I mean, there are several books on it, but the, the latest one by, by James Lukatsky, George Knapp, and Colm Kelleher, I, I think uh, Skinwalker at the Pentagon goes into a, a lot of that. Right. And subsequently, uh, Lou Elizondo, of course, does feature in that book, as does Chris Mellon, but subsequently, I think when the funding for that dried up, uh, people like Elizondo continued carrying the torch. There, there's a lot of debate about this right now on social media, a lot of controversy, uh, a lot of disagreements, but yeah. Okay, well, I just wanna say to people new to this whole disclosure world, there's a lot of key players and this series will also go through and highlight some of those key players. Let me just ask uh, Deborah, how are we doing on time? And I just want to sum up in a way where we're at. Um, can you un unmute yourself, Deborah? Yeah, this is a good time to share what we have coming up. Right, but, but one more question, just to kind of pull this little um, piece together for Nick and the Her Talks is, where is disclosure going at this point? I'll start with Nick first. Um, what do we have to look forward to with government unveilings? Well, like I said, more congressional hearings, and that, some of those will be, be obviously the regular classified reports that were mandated in the Defense Authorization Act. But I'm sure building on what happened on Tuesday, many congressional representatives, uh, people like Mike Gallagher, who, who read into the record, and this was extraordinary, he read into the record, uh, the Wilson memo. Uh, I, I, don't, I doubt that we'll have time to do a deep dive into that, but just the fact that Representative Gallagher said, I want this, I, I want, I'm reading it into the record. Um, Admiral Wilson admitted some top secret information about the presence of aliens uh, that was recorded by Eric Davis. And yes, Gallagher put that in the congressional record, which was astounding, wasn't it? it, it absolutely astounding. So we're going to see. And Mike Gallagher wasn't the only congressional representative com coming out of that session a little bit angry. You've, you've probably seen a few few little snippets. I mean, for example, it was quite extraordinary that uh, Moultrie and Bray were asked about the Maelstrom incident mm. from 1967, I believe, the, the alleged missile shutdown case. Mm. And they, they kind of looked confused. There was a grudging acknowledgement that perhaps they'd vaguely heard of it, but didn't know much about it. Maelstrom was where a UFO shut down um, nuclear warheads. And we'll, we're going to have a little clip of Danny Sheehan talking about that. But I guess my big question is how close or far are we from mentioning or getting the A word out that, yes, we're not alone? And 
Uh, what's your estimate on that, Nick? And I'll ask. Oh, I don't. I, I wouldn't like to put a, a a date on it, but I would look to the big. I would look to the big science projects like James Webb Space Telescope, like the Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, when when that's finished, perhaps at the end of the decade, as being either the discoverer of something or the enabler for this. Mm. Good point. Good point. Actually, I wanted to sell people asking questions. We're going to take questions at the end of the session and hopefully we'll have enough time for all of them. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Dr. Hertog, when do you think we'll get the full on disclosure? We're not alone in the universe. We know that already. And it's a public um, movement. It's a people's movement. But when will we get the official word? It's sort of like the church saying that we're not the center of the universe. So, um, well, this is, uh, $64 million question. I was participating at the first disclosure conference uh, back in 1995. With John Mack. With John Mack and others from throughout the world. And the diplomatic community was not ready for that information at that time. But I believe there's a, a, a search forward in terms of the global interest in the subject. And I wrote a book called Negotiating with Other Worlds where I said it's important to show the cosmic others that we are peacemakers, that we agree with the UN Charter that we are not going to put missiles and weapons of mass destruction out of space. I, unfortunately, this nullify what we believe one of the Russian missions to Phobos. Uh, we want to show ourselves that we are mature enough to make this great transition from humankind into space kind. It may take several decades, it may be sooner than that, according to our indigenous friends here in Arizona and other parts of Africa and South America who believe the galactic community is coming closer to, to visible contact because we have not heard the cry of Mother Earth and we're dying. And the information from the United Nations uh, and what we have seen at the South Pole, the melt, rapid melt 10 times faster than mathematics suggested in 1976 shows us we're going to have to bootstrap some very important decisions to bring out a new sociology and psychology to go along with the technology and science of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And one can go so far as to say, I think some of the extraterrestrials are here to try to help us with our environmental problems, again, not only through technology, but maybe through their own technology, such as what I believe there was a sighting of um, an extraterrestrial spaceship over Fukushima shortly after. And there's a place called, I think it's uh, Tucha in Argentina that constantly, it's a nuclear power plant, but it constantly has leakages. And, and all of the declassified CI reports in 1976, they referred to nuclear weapon sites from, from Maine to Montana visited on a higher level. So we know that the cosmic others want us to, should we say, stand back from the what I want to call the technical drift towards self-destruction. And we've also supported a space treaty saying, let's not put any weapons mm -hmm. at all into outer space. But that, that astronaut Edgar Mitchell was part of it. I just want to read the need to ensure the use of outer space for peaceful purposes in accordance with Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, that is the UN Treaty, remains relevant with the preferred interpretation of the concept of quote-unquote peaceful and quote-unquote non-military instead of the minimum municipal or the minimal non-aggressive terminology. So we are really at a standpoint between the spheres of making contact with our new self. This is the importance of your book, Alan. We must see ourselves as peacemakers at the edge of civilization making this bridge to cosmic civilization. Right. And then they I, will I, I just want to say the people who go out and do close encounter five meditations are putting out a feeling of love and openness. And those are the people that see it. Maybe I'll get John Martin on this program where he plays music to these spheres and send out love and they appear to him all the time. So, okay, let's move on, but thank you. That's a good wrap, stay there. And Deborah, what do we have to look forward to now? <laughs> yeah, unmute, Deborah, yes. You're, um, you're well, good. we've got more of this and much, much more. You guys, you were amazing. Thank you so much for enlightening us with what's happening now um, and for your passion of being on this for so many years to help us with what's exploding now in terms of all this information. So thank you so much. And we've got a five-part series coming up. 
Um, so, and, and we're going to show you some clips of some of the amazing speakers that are going to be coming to you. This will begin June 2nd. So we've got another couple of weeks. We're going to keep getting out the word of what's happening. And then we'll start June 2nd and go for four consistent Thursdays. And everything's on replay. So you can be with us live or you can join the replay. And so what we just heard from Nick Pope and Desiree and JJ Hurtock is a kind of parameters of the whole um, phenomena itself. This is what's coming up. Episode one is what we're doing now. Deep dive into government insiders. I'm going to show who that is. Then we do a, a science of UAPs, UFOs, and then the secrets of the soul. Why is it, why are they really here? And then we finish with a star seed round table. So I'm going to show a little bit. This is part two, and this is where Danny Sheehan, the people's lawyer, the person who defended John Mack and a lot of a lot of public interest groups and and Steve Bassett, who's the only lobbyist in Washington who fighting for UFO disclosure. So this is Danny Sheehan first talking about what this issue uh, has uh, numerous dimensions uh, to it, uh, a dozen of which uh, come to mind very quickly. If these are not vehicles from, uh, if we say one of our adversaries, (laughs) <laughs> like Russia or China, or what, however one might conceive of that, uh, and they don't belong to the United States. They're not some ultra-secret uh, technology that's been somehow concealed from the rest of the militaries. Uh, from the perspective of the Defense Department, uh, some potential threat uh, in, in their peculiar perception of things. Uh, you know, there, there's the old, the old Sufi saying that when a pickpocket meets a saint, all he sees are his pockets, uh, and uh, and so that if you're if you're a military defense specialist, any any vehicle uh, coming into uh, U.S. airspace uh, that we define that hasn't been authorized to be there or gotten permission ahead of time to be there is viewed as a threat. That's just how they perceive things. Uh, and Lou Elizondo, the fellow who had been the head of the the, the secret uh, space program in the UFO investigation division of the Pentagon, has been quoted as saying, "Look, as a uh, as a defense specialist, I have to kind of perceive this phenomenon as a potential threat. But if I take off my military hat and think of this just as a human being, it it strikes me that this presents this extraordinary opportunity." Uh, for our human family. I've been retained as legal counsel uh, by Lou Elizondo. uh, He resigned from the United States Defense Department, more or less in protest over the fact that that people were not uh, taking this seriously uh, for some reason. He couldn't quite figure it out that uh, with, with all of these vehicles flying around, he had come to discover that the, the UFOs have actually appeared over the top of uh, U.S. and Minutemen uh, missile silos, uh, where you have a dozen uh, nuclear missiles uh, poised to be fired at the Soviet Union or China at any given moment. Uh, and the vehicles have turned off uh, the nuclear missiles, uh, rendered them useless uh, so they could not be used. Uh, but allowed them to be then turned back on uh, after a, a brief demonstration of the capacity of the UFOs. They have been, uh, and so that you can see from the narrow perspective of the Defense Department how they become somewhat anxious uh, over the fact that there, there is the, this display of technology that dwarfs uh, their uh, supposed uh, superior firepower. That's a point that Nick brought out just in the recent discussion we had here uh, that that was brought up by one of the Congress people that um, if they heard about this to these people that giving the presentation, right, Nick? And they said they had not heard that nuclear warheads were shut off. Isn't that correct? Yes. I, I mean, clearly we are in a situation here where if you look at what happened on Tuesday, if, if that's being truthful about the situation, DOD is acting as if all this started in 2004, and they forget that this phenomenon has, well, according, even in the modern era, a a near 
80-year backstory that we're not hearing about. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, of being able to establish full spectrum dominance over our planet. And this is Steve Bass. Steve and I have been working together since uh, the dawn of time. Somebody, somebody in the UFO community has to take responsibility for keeping both feet on the ground and talking with uh, with representatives and their staff and and coming to grips with the real world, which is functioning at a at a, a fairly low frequency. Uh, in the realm of political reality in Washington, D.C. So, uh, so Stephen has been the laboring in the vineyard in Washington, D.C. for uh, gee, like, it's probably 30 years now. Uh, bless bless Stephen Bassett, you know, because he's, he's doing this job. Other people are, are doing different things, uh, uh, having contact experiences, holding conferences, you know, uh, reaching out to people in the executive branch and, and having meetings. And, and uh, Steve has been focused on uh, trying to do everything that he can to get uh, the executive branch to come forward with important information that, that we're all certain that they, they have. I'm, a, uh, I'm not a researcher, uh, uh, not a UFO researcher. My take on this and the reason I do what I do is the truth embargo on the ET issue, which the government has imposed since 47, is no longer uh, appropriate. It's it's uh, it's it's beyond its shelf life. I like to say. And in fact, it's become a huge liability and an embarrassment. And it's also denying the human race an extraordinary opportunity to rethink its relationship between each other and with the planet. The pressure on the environment is massive. Uh, the wars that we've conducted have been huge. The weapons have gotten bigger and more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So now we're all walking on eggshells with uh, swords hanging over our heads, uh, constantly thinking about crises and so forth, and we're not solving problems at all. Th this, is, this is a recipe for an incredibly bad 21st century. The government's refusal to allow the world's people to know they're not alone, to know that they are engaged now by other civilizations uh, is preventing that reassessment, that worldview change. That, that's going to be June 2nd, Danny Sheehan and Steve Bassett, and they're going to go as deep as they can into the politics of disclosure and what we can hope to see over the next year, few years. Now, on the on the next episode, which is actually a third episode, June 9th, we're going to have Carolyn Corey talk about um, her movie. Um, the I guarantee, the guarantee a thousand percent that advanced civilizations have a technology. They know how to transport themselves from point A to point B faster than the speed of light. Boom. Through these nodes. The, if these points within space, these the, coordinates. These stairs in the sky, you're saying. Exactly, exactly. And so oh, on the show that we're going to do June 9th, you have David Mason and you have Travis Taylor, star of history. I would like to go deeper into the discussion about reformulating what the universe is really like. I mean, is that something you think these guys can do or take a stab at? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the idea. That's why I recommended that you have those two guys because, you know, they will give even more technical detail because the scientists are going to be able to explain more the, the possible dynamics and mechanics from a, a light bending perspective or from a magnetic field kind of concentration. So it's, it's going to be fascinating to get into that conversation. So um, yeah, she did a movie called A Tear in the Sky, which is to prove the science of, um, of the UFO existence, that there really is these magnetic fields and these um, uh, doorways that they have opened. The Tear in the Sky is a portal that she found. Travis Taylor's in that movie. is going to be joining us on June 9th. He's also the star of The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. Dr. Travis Taylor. As an astrophysicist, aerospace engineer, and an optical scientist with over 30 years of experience working with NASA and the Department of Defense, I've always been intensely curious about the unknowns in the universe. 
So in 2021, when our own government acknowledged that unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, are real, it was no surprise to see how the media, the public, and Congress wanted answers. It could be a portal, or a wormhole, or some massive energy source, or even a gravitational field. Those sound like far off ideas to me, but we know that there's something strange going on up there, and we need to get more data to determine what it is. We need to get out of here, guys. Let's get out of here. Okay. So that was that episode. That's June 9th. On, on June 16th, really one of my favorites, the one I'm really looking forward to is with the following. We have um, Whitley Strieber there coming up who wrote the book Communion, and Whitley really gave us the face of E.T. in 1987, 88. He wrote that book and shocked people about what he said about his own experience. Joining Whitley on that program is Kamara Jones, who's one of the most amazing E.T. artists I've ever seen. She paints and draws these multidimensional beings, and she's going to be dialoguing with another one. You look at the history of this Linda Moulton Howe. Planet is demonstrably one in which homo sapiens sapiens is abused. Because from my point of view, if you are a civilization that evolves for 12,000 years, and you are always under the thumb of another intelligence that manipulates you, and that humans are never ever mm. talked to, communicated honestly, then we are today in the 21st century, 12,000 years later. We are an abused species. And part of this abused species is going out into the Milky Way galaxy and beyond without a single general human population okay. knowing okay. Okay. and but being told we're not alone. Once we do know, what does that mean? What is that? How does that shift our reality? that we are finally finally being given respect enough for the truth of something so huge <laughs> we're not only not alone in the universe and that i would stress there are other intelligences and they really care mm -hmm. about us and they want us to get past this difficult time of lies deception by other forces that have never told humans the truth that is why we've got to have this revolutionary headline Gr and contact oh yeah making contact this is oh it is valuable for everybody thank you why is it valuable because i know all these people i know what, how difficult it is to get to facts to get to a pattern in which it will help other human beings who have never ever seen any of our other films been to any of our conferences we have got to start where the news on tv and radio and newspapers begin to understand and start reporting what i have been reporting for 42 years feeling like i have been pushing a huge thousand pound boulder up a hill we are at the point where it might finally reach the top. Once that boulder starts going, the whole planet changes in relationship to this universe and the understanding that there's probably an infinite number of universes, infinite number of timelines, infinite number of dimensions. And we could now solve that, those issues and move forward as a real, um, intelligent civilization that's meeting these beings on an equal footing. That's what I feel. That would be my prayer. So, and then the last part of the last show we conclude with is the star seeds hybrids and human evolution. What's that really looking like? Anything you want to say about that, Deborah? Definitely. This is going to be one of my favorite shows because it really takes us into what are we going to do with the alien, with the galactics? What is our relationship? What is our spiritual relationship with them? And Mary Wadwell, she's been studying contactees for so many years. She's amazing. And she's going to give a lot of documentation of starseeds, especially the children that are coming in now that are connected. 
Adam Apollo, who claims himself as a starseed, is highly intelligent and understands all the alien races and who we are as starseeds that have come here to help this planet at this point. Right. And then one of my favorite new discoveries is Marina Seren. If you just look at her, she looks like she's from someplace else. She's very smart and very in touch. And she says there's she's coming into some conflict with what the gray aliens want to do with humans and with the hybrid um, sort of manufacturing. So she'll talk about her story of what it's like and some of the hardships she's had being a starseed. So that will conclude the series on on June 23rd, of course. And this is, if you just go to this QR code, you can um, register there for the whole series. And um, we'll get back to that QR code. But um, uh, so here we have the layout of the whole thing from Nick Poe, hardware disclosure, and the Hertog's interdimensionality. But I want to bring it all together into like a kind of cohesive understanding of of our human future because this is really what the theme is this is why Deborah is so excited because she's been about ascension about transformation so I'll ask you Nick what does the future look like it can't go on like this cat and mouse game of a little bit here no no nothing it's it's been happening for 75, 80 years. We, the, the jig is up, I think, isn't it? Well, it, as you say, it has been going on 75 or 80 years. And uh, the pessimistic view is that it might continue to, to go on. But you know what? I, I suspect that this is an events-led field. And that's, in one sense, the great thing about this. You never know what suddenly and unexpectedly is going to burst upon us, hopefully in a good way, from out of left field. So we, you know, we should never forget that it's events that drive this forward. So yes, we should all continue to, to research and investigate and lobby and things like that. But at the end of the day, a lot of this is out of our hands. It'll either happen or it won't. And, and you know, I don't know how mm -hmm. and and, and what form it's going to take. But something, eventually, every race comes to the finish line. Something will push us over that line. But isn't something different now than it was, let's say, in 1969 when Project Blue... There's talk about what is different in this era. Well, I would say two things, maybe three things. Firstly, the technology. James Webb, Square Kilometer Array, the um, Deep Space Network, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, the internet and social media connects us all far more. You know, no longer does something happen and you read about it a month later. The other thing, maybe the most important thing of all, the will has changed. You know, people, people are now deciding. We, we have citizen scientists and citizen journalists. And, uh, you, you know, I think people are not prepared anymore to just wait for the government to give them something. The view has flipped. Let's go and get it ourselves. Right, right. And doc, thank you, Nick. And Dr. Hertog, how does this look like it's going to unfold? Because you're already in the camp that has made contact on some level. And you're... you're well, we've heard actually the voices uh, have been recorded from uh, pilots uh, of the AT speaking in at least three different languages. This information ultimately will be released. It's not a surprise to us that contact is much closer, but contact means, as your book suggests, we must raise our consciousness and realize we're multidimensional beings. Our consciousness is local and non-local, as the Stanford Research Institute studies have shown. And so we are facing a brave new world, but that requires a sense of responsibility, a sense of balance between that part of the psyche that was traditionally spiritual slash multidimensional in that part of the psyche, which was dominant scientific or realm of, should we say, reductionistic science. So we see a marriage taking place with great uh, writers like David in the Old Testament tells us in Psalm 51, there has to be a new spirit, a willing spirit, i.e. what uh, Nick has just said, and a Holy Spirit coming together. This triple power was recognized by the great thinkers of East, West, North, and South. When we begin to see 
all of the disciplines involved with the new image of humanity as a collective, then we can move through the collective consciousness. Right, and I just want to add, yeah, what Linda Mullen Howe also talks about is it sometimes having contact with these extraterrestrials is not like you can sit down over coffee. Some of them are so advanced that it's a whole new technology. And I believe, and I write about it in, in your book, Alan, that you know contact is there and it's many people are having it and not even aware of it. And so that's extremely important as well. And I think that scares the pants off of the government. One, they have no control over it. Two, that you know, people are having downloads, as I call it, or information from this. Technology is advancing on different levels. Dr. Tech's book, Keys of Enoch, actually mentions that 60, 2004. That 60, yeah, mentions the year 2004 as a key breaking point, but also that 64 areas of science would advance. So we can make contact because we can't be primitives, you know, driving horse and buggies, so to speak, and then contact with extraterrestrials. We've got to do it on a closer to peer level. And I think that's what they're waiting for and a peaceful level as well. Well, that's what I said by, I wrote this book as a collection, as a, a compilation of essays by people like Nick Pope and, and the Hertox and Whitley Strieber, Linda Moulton Howe, Grant Cameron, uh, John Mack, there's an essay that I'm previously unpublished because nobody has the whole perspective. And I think that's the problem with government. Nick, don't you? like? How do they explain something they don't understand? There's so many multiple facets, not just to the craft, but to the beings and people's experiences. Is, is that part of the problem that, well, the MOD had in what you think the US government's having? Well, I, I'm tempted to say that's one of many problems that government has. Um, yeah, it, it's certainly one of them for sure. Right. So. Where do we go from here? I think we have to lay it all out on the table, per partition government, and that's why we're having Danny Sheehan and, and um, Steve Bassett on, because they are inside as much as anyone to push these people to open up the files. Let's see the bodies. Let's see the craft. And as a civilization, not just U.S., but a planetary civilization to make sense of this, and like the subtitle of the book says, preparing for the new realities of extraterrestrial existence. And that's one more question I had. You had a question, Deborah? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say I want to address uh, the, the cosmic awakening. Because yeah. I feel like the galactics are here at this time because Earth is going through a planetary ascension. This is a quickening that's happening. It's a raising of consciousness. And they are waiting for humanity to evolve and wake up so we can participate in the galactic universe with the Galactic Federation. This is all part of an evolution. Now, they can't come in and fix us and make us awaken. They can support us. They can be there. But it's us raising our consciousness, raising our frequency, raising our ability to not rage, to not wage war, but to wage love and operate at a whole new level. So this is all part of a quickening and awakening that's happening now. And this is what our series is about and we're, we're here to communicate with. So and that's why I yeah. love having you here besides all the other incredible stuff you do behind the scenes. <laughs> we're going into Homo Galacticos. Yeah, we're going to be changing our consciousness and it's going to be shocking, I think. I mean, I've seen uh, vehicles and, you know, as logical as you can say, oh, I know that they exist. It's a shock and the energy is very, very different from just, you know, what you run by a car somewhere. But we well, have to go to a global commons mm -hmm. through a university without walls approach. Well, and here the work of that... all of the great minds and poets and musicians are all part of the new renaissance. Well. That's my point is that they are so different than us that we have to change our worldview and our perspective because if they show up in our space, we'll react in fear. And I don't think they are here to react, for us to react in fear, but to meet them on an even playing field. So the more government comes out with this, the more he says, yes, this is the reality. We won't have the ontological shock that John Mack has talked about in his work. We'll have a reality that's more assimilatable into the fact that we're not alone in the universe. This is what Linda Moulton has been pushing for for nearly 50 years. So with that, let's just see if there's any questions that, um, do you see anything in the chat, Neil, um, Nick, that you would like um, that to address? 
Oh, one... it, it's it's all scrolling up so quickly. I know, I, I I'll know. let you pick something out. Yeah, Alan's the best. <laughs> the question I have that I didn't actually see here, if, if the government is so worried about national security, they recently in these hearings acknowledged that this is happening in other countries. So what's the national security if this is happening to other countries isn't that a contradiction this is going on around the world and they know that so is it who's threatening us it's it's not other countries and are we really being threatened or when they shut off our nuclear warheads are they telling us there's something wrong with what we're doing so what's your opinion nick well, I think it's very difficult to, to, we can only come at problems like that from an anthropocentric perspective. So, right. you, you know, while we might say, oh, well, they're sending us a message that we should do this or we shouldn't do that. That's frankly just our anthropocentric interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's not my particular field, but I will, you mentioned the, the information sharing, which came up at the hearings. This was clearly a reference to the five eyes nations and the, the intelligence sharing that goes on between the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And this has come up before in some aspects of this. Uh, so we know that there's intelligence sharing on this issue to some extent, and I think both Moultrie and Bray did, did say, we, we are giving some information to allies and we are receiving some information from allies. What they didn't say, but they certainly implied, is that they are you know, attempting to leverage information out of adversaries through all the usual spying means. Right. Well, that's one perspective. I think if this is happening around the world, there's no national security threat to us in particular because... But I think something else is a threat, the fact that the vibration of the world is changing and those that want to keep it at a lower level will have to give up their power. The, JJ, you're very much in tune with that. And, and Desiree, please add to that conversation. I was just going to say that I know you feel very strongly, Alan, and so do we, that if they wanted us dead, we'd be dead. And so obviously, if they've been around for It'll be 75 years with Roswell coming up and probably more before that. And I even think it goes even longer back, but let's just say 75, 80 years. You know, they have slowly initiated us into greater contact. And I think that's positive. And I think even the governments of the world holding back for various reasons are doing it, but still we are moving forward. I think that's the important thing. And they don't want us dead. I mean, there are, you know, sunburns, there are, uh, we'll say in some cases, abductions. I, that's one of the things that Credo and we talked about a lot. There's not just one intelligence out there. I want to make sure that's very clear. I think it is right. for most of the people here, but there are different agendas for different intelligences. And that's an important reality to realize. And I think that's also really, you know, given a big problem to the government, because you can't just come out and say, oh, yeah, there's these guys from the Pleiades or from Arcturus that are here visiting uh, occasionally. Well, the ancient Greek and Hebrew philosophers spoke of the psyche or psyche, the, the Hebrew word nefesh, the inner soul. That seems to be the, uh, should we say, the theme behind the external phenomena that Linda and others have looked right. at. And we, so in Linda, combination with leaders throughout the world, both in government as well as of the major religions have, so we say, brought us into a realization that there is a gathering of the nations. Right, and maybe Linda will say this in your program, but she says that some of these other extraterrestrial intelligence, usually those that are quite different from ours, are intrigued by our soul, yeah. by our emotions, by our love, by our abilities, and that they don't have that. They're more clone-like intelligences. And of course, a clone intelligence can still have emotions, but these guys are less you know, vibrational than we are. So there's this whole gamut, and I think that is a real problem, but also... Uh, we seem to be surviving and growing, and I think contact is, I, I think, inevitable in the next, I would even I, say, five to ten. I think it's inevitable, too. I'll, I'll read just one question, because there's so many by Susan Terry. How can we collaborate and shed a bright light that breaks through the media propaganda and shakes up the world? Is it possible there will be a split in dimensional levels of consciousness? I think we're seeing that, but what do you say, J.J.? We need more people like Foster Grant and yourself. Foster Gamble. Foster Gamble. <laughs> yeah. Well, to open the spectrum and look at the provocative subjects that uh, 
ivory tower intellectuals will not look at. We have to see the big picture, which means we have to recognize that we are a microcosm of the mind of the universe. And we're seeing right now really the redefinition of scientific ontology, the recognition that we are a, a consciousness life form that uh, connects with many dimensions and that in this process, we're going to go beyond, beyond Einsteinian science to future science or science guided by consciousness. And so this is really the beginning of a whole new page of evolution, recognizing the human evolution is indeed connected with what we call a higher evolution. And we're talking a little bit more like what Deborah had brought out, that there seems to be, uh, we'll say portals opening, veils lifting, and we ourselves in our own personal realities, maybe in dream states, are having some of these experiences and getting ourselves soul-wise and conscious-wise prepared for contact. Right. Okay. Uh, just one, we're going to wrap up soon. I just want one more question to Nick and thank you so much for being here for two hours with us and more Nick. Um, in your book, in the chapter you wrote for making contact at the end, you talk about the future of space and space travel and, and you're very much grounded in this world. So can you, can you just reiterate what you, your vision of our future and space is? Sure. Well, I, it's not that we want to go out into space and, and among the stars. It's that we must, uh, because eventually, you know, the sun will expand and the earth will be burnt to a crisp. And, you know, we could migrate further out into the solar system. But ultimately, humanity must travel to the stars uh, to, to survive, to explore, to grow, etc. And I'm glad that this is now being wrested away out of the grip of government. And, and so we see people like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Yuri Milner basically saying, we're going to take the space program out of the hands of government and we're, we're going to do our own thing. And, and more and more will follow it. It will be exactly like the early days of flight. Eventually, you know, in, in the early days, um, a few people were doing it and, and then there were, you know, and then eventually there's a democratization of it and, and eventually getting on a plane is something we do sort of routinely. So we're going to see that and I don't know what we'll find out there. I think uh, we've all got our ideas. Some have maybe seen glimpses, but uh, the technology is coming. If you look even at the ATIP contract, you'll see that as part of that, they were studying everything that's needed maybe to get us there, anti-gravity, uh, warp drive, wormholes, stargates, no longer science fiction, but things that you can read that theoretical physicists have been working on, on, on some of these programs. So our future, all our futures is out there and bring it on, bring it on. Beautiful. Thank you. JJ and Desiree. JJ, we have one more question for you. You've actually met higher consciousness beings. What can we learn from your experience and what can you give, transmit to the audience watching today to prepare them for higher consciousness interaction? Well, some of you know I've had telepathic communication and I have, well, as a scientist as well as a philosopher uh, in uh, intellectual history, have looked at the milestones. And right now we're at a troublesome point of taking a great leap forward or backwards, the way we use our technology. So we must, shall we say, be humanitarian in our outreach to cosmic others. We must show them that we are graduating beyond really the tribal warfare scenarios that have crippled us in civilization. But we must be willing to write a new charter and realize that we are being inducted into what I believe a galactic family where we'll become galactic citizens. Right, on a positive level also continue with that, it's important to know that we really are not alone. And I don't mean that there's just beings flying around out there, that there are beings from Dr. Jax actually had like a direct experience, we call it a Merkaba experience, but that he actually saw that these beings are here to help. Like I said, they may be even helping on our environmental level as much as they can. They're certainly helping our technological and they're helping us consciously to grow, to be closer, to be part of them. They are not leaving us alone. We are not left completely. And that's so important to know and to feel and to understand that there are beings out there, whether it's in the 
third dimension, the fifth dimension, the 24th dimension, other frequencies that are really trying to look after us and guide us and help us. We must have grace and gratitude and under to understand the glory of the divine source or the source of all sources. That before the Big Bang, there is a consciousness and we're beginning to discover a new science that will change really the whole spectrum of all of the disciplines. And we will graduate, I believe, in the gathering of all peoples of goodwill into a galactic society. Part of our cosmic cousins. Yeah. Well, that's where you and Nick agree is time for graduation. And, and, and this has been a great introduction. Deborah, can you believe that was two hours? That, I'm, I'm so engaged and I'm so excited about this level of conversation where we can really dissect it in an intelligent way and from many different perspectives. So I'm excited about what's coming up on this series because this just opened the door. It's just a tear in the sky, as Carol and Corey would say, into what's coming. So do you, what, do you, what do you have to say to conclude, Deborah? Well, this was amazing. I knew it would be. We have much more coming. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be receiving your replay tomorrow. We'll notify you on email uh, that the replay is here. Please sign up for the whole series. This supports yeah. us going forward. It's going to be amazing. And yeah. replays will be really easily available. So you don't always have to be here live, but it's certainly fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so please sign up. And definitely want to thank our sponsors, Portal to Ascension, an amazing online program of the most cutting edge programs. Mm -hmm. PortalToAscension.org mm -hmm. will have uh, the producer of that series that is online with us at the June 2nd program yes. and also Star Family Wisdom, another podcast that's really amazing. They are helping us to bring you this program. Very but please also, people. yeah, I'm just saying. Please also are... spread the word because we want this information to get out far and wide. Makingcontactseries.com. People can sign up and get the free replay. It's gonna be on there. Um, if they sign up, the replay is going to be available there, and then they have a choice to sign up for the series if they want. But we're making this program free to everyone. So please spread the word, makingcontactseries.com, and, and that will help us get out farther because we are disclosure. And you can hold your phone up to this QR code, and it'll take you right to the link as well. But you're right, we are disclosure because it is a people's movement. Obviously, what we saw on Tuesday is like, they're not opening their mouths. They're not going to tell us the truth. There is no transparency. This is up to all of us. So all the comments, the chat has been recorded. It's all valuable. Everything that everyone has said here tonight and all the people that we'll be seeing are adding to this momentum. And even though it doesn't look like we got to the finish line on Tuesday, the race continues and we are off and running, all of us. So thank you, Nick Pope. Oh, Nick, you have some stuff coming up, right? Do you want to just talk about it? Oh, well, I was just going to very briefly mention that it's, yes. it's my honor and privilege at the moment to be hosting and moderating Ancient Aliens Live Project Earth. We've done two live dates already. Uh, we have two more coming up this weekend, one in Akron, Ohio, the next in Milwaukee. And we hope to announce many further dates all around the United States uh, soon. So watch this space, Ancient Aliens Live. Right. And look for Nick on Ancient Aliens in general. And um, he's around. He's on all the media. If there's a break in the news about a UFO, Nick will be there. He is the... <laughs> Fox Mulder of our time, the X-Files guy. So thanks. And JJ, Desiree, you have a bunch of things coming up too. Right. So it, it's only next weekend and Memorial Day weekend in Palm Beach with uh, Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden and other friends. But Alan, you and I and us, we do stuff all to, well, together. Aren't we speaking at Lightning in a Bottle Memorial Day weekend? We are also. If you have younger people like that kind of music, we're doing we're doing the Thursday night and you're continuing. So on. our motto is Ot Ostra to the stars. Right, to the stars. And Deborah and I will be at Disclosure Fest on June 18th in Historic Park in LA. Deborah's doing the Ascension panel and I'll be talking about the idea of making contact. I'm also talking, if you're in the Sedona area, tomorrow, May 20th at Contact 2022 up at the Posse Grounds. And 
A lot of stuff. So just follow us all online. I'm doing a retreat in July with ascensiontogether.org. This has been really uh, an acceleration of my consciousness working on this project with you, Deborah. Thank you to all your team, Sherea, Lindsay, Jessica. Everyone who's contributed to make this. And this is this is a huge pro It may look like oh, we just got on Zoom. This was a huge production, so and that's why we had a thousand people registered. Any final words from you, Deborah? Um, just bottom line, love. We're all here to be loved, to share love, and to share together. We all came to this planet at this amazing time to do our missions. Everyone here is here, and I and we inspire everyone else to do your part of whatever you're inspired to. For the awakening that's happening now in terms of sharing disclosure or whatever else you're called to do because it's all hands on deck in creating the new earth at this point right so if you're looking at this sign up for the full series because we're going to go deeper in next week in two weeks with danny she and steve bassett after that with travis taylor and carolyn corey on june 16th with um whitley streber linda moulton howe and kamara jones and then on June 23rd, with the Star Seeds, Admiral Apollo, Mary Rodwell, and Marina Seren. And that just kind of takes us back. That's like a whole spectrum of ideas. I'm Alan Steinfeld. Check out my book. But really, thank you all for being here today and just adding your energy to a field of consciousness that's about making a change on the planet for human civilizations, because we are not alone. We've never been alone. We're part of a bigger picture of higher consciousness. And when we wake up to that, we'll wake up to who we really are and we'll start making contact with ourselves, the earth, each other, and the cosmos. So it's been really my pleasure to work with Deborah and everyone here on this program. And we'll see you in two weeks. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. All online. Thank you.